Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Nemat. I was born in 1965 in Tehran, Iran. Back then, Iran, unlike today, was not an Islamic republic. We had a king, we called him the Shah. I'm from a Christian family. I grew up in downtown Tehran. My parents, my dad, he was a ballroom dancing instructor in Tehran. Yes, ballroom dancing. And my mother had a beauty salon. So I grew up between the sounds of the cha-cha and the tango and women with really big poofy hair. <laughs> we had a cottage by the Caspian Sea, and that is where I spent my summers. In 1978, right before the success of the Islamic Revolution, I would wear my little polka dot bikini on the beach, and my friends and I we would be dancing to the tunes of the Bee Gees. I watched the Donnie and Marie Osmond show every Thursday night, and the Little House on the Prairie every Friday night. I wanted to become a medical doctor, and it was not a far-fetched dream. Women could become whatever they wanted in Iran back then. A woman could become a judge, a woman could even become a prime minister. So I was looking forward to a bright future. In 1978, when we got back home from the cottage, there was a tank parked at my door. The Islamic Revolution of 1979. I watched from my window as the street would fill with angry demonstrators yelling slogans against the Shah and talking about social justice and freedom and democracy. Ayatollah Khomeini had become the leader of this revolution, and Iran became an Islamic republic. For a few months, it was great. There was freedom. The new constitution had not been written yet. You could basically get away with anything. And when you're 13, trust me, that's a good thing. But then this new constitution based on religious laws were, was written and it came into power. One day I looked around me and dancing had become illegal. Singing had become illegal. Holding your boyfriend's hand in public had become illegal. Wearing makeup and perfume were illegal. Basically having fun. Now, imagine if you're 13, 14 years old and having fun becomes illegal, what are you going to do? Go silently into the night? I don't think so. Teenagers, they rebel against the color of the wall. <laughs> so, you know what? If they tell you having fun is illegal, you're going to do something about it when you're 14 years old. And we did. My friends and I, we were on the streets of Tehran protesting. And every protest rally, was attacked by the newly formed Revolutionary Guard. In spring of 1981, the wave of mass arrests began. The wave of mass arrests of young people. Teenagers, my friends, were getting arrested. They came for me on January 15, 1982. I was at home about to take a shower. The doorbell rang, my mother called my name, it was like 10 o'clock at night. I opened the bathroom door and there were two really big guns pointed in my face. The guards, they took me downstairs, put me in a car, and they drove me to Evin Prison, which is still 100% operational as we speak. It still has many prisoners. I was blindfolded upon arrival, taken along hallway after hallway after hallway. Eventually, I was taken for interrogation. I was 16 years old. 16. I couldn't see anything, but I could hear stuff. So the man that was in the room with me, he asked me, have you attended protest rallies against the government? I said, yes. Everybody knew I attended protest rallies. The princip my principal knew, the shopkeepers knew, my parents knew, everybody knew. He asked me, have you written articles against the government? I said, yes, in my school newspaper. Then he wanted to know the whereabouts of a girl. I didn't know where she was. I would have told them I, I had no reason not to. Then they took me to another room. And there, they took off my blindfold. I was in a small room with two men, Ali and Hamid. There was a desk, two chairs, and a bare wooden bed. They asked me again, where is this girl? And I said, listen, I really don't know. They handcuffed me. And when they handcuffed me, I was 90 pounds back then. When they handcuffed me, they saw that my hands are going to slide out of the cuff. So they put my wrists together, and they put the two wrists into one cuff. And as it clicked, my right wrist cracked. And the torture had not even begun. If the devil was so kind to appear and say to me, Marina, sell me your soul, and I will get you back home to your mother, I would have sold my soul with whipped cream and a cherry on top. I would have done anything to back home to my mother, but that was not an option. They tied me to the bare wooden bed. 
I was lying down on my stomach. They took off my socks and my shoes, and they lashed the soles of my feet with a length of cable. And when I say cable, I mean it. It's like a garden hose, but it is not hollow. It is full heavy rubber. This is the most common method of torture in the Middle East. They beat the bare soles of your feet. Why? Because our nerve ends are in our feet. With every strike of the lash, your nervous system explodes and then is magically put back together and you're wide awake for the next. You think you're going to die, you think you're going to pass out, you don't. What this pain does, it disassembles your brain. I started to count, I forgot how to count. I think I got to six. I started praying, I'm a Christian, I started saying Hail Marys and I forgot the words to it. I mean, I sneeze and I say Hail, Hail Mary. How can I forget the words? But my brain had fallen apart. All that ex existed, the only thing that existed was this dark, immense pain. Eventually they saw, they made me sit up, I looked at my feet and I laughed out loud. It, it was funny, my feet looked like overgrown party balloons with toes on them. I looked like Bugs Bunny. It was funny. I laughed, and then they beat me again because they thought I was resisting. So they beat you like that, then they make you walk. They beat you, they make you walk. They beat you, they make you walk. Why do they stagger? Because they want to inflict as much suffering as possible without killing you. The question is, what is the point of torture? Is torture to get information? Absolutely not. I would have confessed I was Jesus Christ under torture. I would have confessed I was a CIA spy. I signed documents. I don't even know what I signed. So torture is not to get information. Is torture to kill you? Absolutely not. There are much more economical ways to kill people. They would shoot you. They would hang you. Somebody will dig a hole. They make you go lie down in it, and somebody will put dirt on you. Torture is hard work. Why do they torture? Torture is designed to kill the human soul. When they succeed, they stop. They don't succeed, they will execute you. And it is not only to kill your soul, but it is to kill the soul of your family, of your community, and of the world. And this is why torture is a crime against humanity. I was given a death sentence. Very easy to get when in prison. It was reduced to life in prison. I spent a lot of time in solitary confinement. They married me off to one of my interrogators. Yes, at the age of 17. And it was absolutely legal. They married girls off to their interrogators because under Iranian law, rape is illegal, but doing that is legal. Many of my friends are buried in mass graves. I don't even know where. Many of my friends were executed at the age of 15, 14, 16, 17. We don't even know where they are. In Evin, I became a witness. No more, no less. I carry the memory of every girl who was in prison with me and who is dead right now. One day, one day, I will go back home. I will go back to Iran. And I will search, and I will find, I promise you, I will find every single mass grave in that country, and there are many. I will walk on my knees, and I will find every one of them. I will dig the dirt with my own bare hands. And I will make sure that those young women, young men and women, are remembered. We need to make the world a better place. We have to. Our lives are at stake here. We need to get out there and make a difference. So I ask you to join me and other speakers, other activists at the Oslo Freedom Forum. Find the movement that makes you excited, that makes your blood boil. If you can give money, that's great, but if you cannot, help us. We need help. You have talents that we don't have. Come and join us. 
and give it time, energy, and effort. And one small step at a time, one tiny small step at a time, we will succeed. And we will defeat these, en these enemies that torture, that commit mass executions, and that want to bury us all. Thank you so much. Thank you.